Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The time of a birth is most often very joyful and even life-changing. Think about it with me. Some of you in this place, you are parents. You remember the day that your child was born. You remember maybe some of the moments about it. You remember the joy that you felt. You remember all the folks coming in to be able to celebrate with you what had just happened. You know, for us, God blessed us through the years, and we realize it is God's favor upon us that we were able to have four children. I'll be honest with you. We weren't planning on four, but God gave us four. My dad called me up one day and said, son, how many children are you going to have? I said, dad, I don't know. We weren't planning on this many, but this is how many we have. And each one has brought joy to our lives. I would say to you that each one has changed our lives as well. That each child brought blessing and each child in some way had transformed and changed who we are as parents, as people, certainly our lives. Children can change things. I remember Loy Seal some years ago saying that when you go from two to three children, that is when you go from man coverage to zone coverage, it really changes things. It can change things. You realize we come here today because of a birth. We come here today because there is joy and because there has been life change. We come here today because there was a day when a baby was born and that baby brings to us joy and that baby has brought to us transformation. That is the reason we gather on Sunday morning every Sunday morning, but is particularly the reason we gather together on Christmas Eve on Sunday morning is to give thanks and to show the joy that we continue to have that a child has been born, that we get to talk about the change. Again, there have been many holidays declared because of the birth of certain children, Maybe individuals that made a difference in our world. Maybe there were politicians or reformers or scientists or teachers or whatever else that those days are set aside for joy and for celebration. May I suggest to you, there should be no greater joy than the joy we have because Jesus has been born. There certainly has been life change because of people. I just said my own children changed our lives. There are people who have impacted the world and they continue to impact the world. But there is no one that has impacted the world like Jesus. A few Sundays ago I mentioned that even the atheist, when he writes the date, he is in some way assuming the birth of Jesus. In some way he is assenting to Jesus changing things. Why? Because we are in the year 2023 and we are almost in the year of 2024. And you know why we say the year 2023 and 2024 is because we go back and we date even our history and our days because of Jesus. Because the birth of Jesus brings celebration and joy. The birth of Jesus brings to us life change. Why? Because this is not a mere child, not a mere man, not a mere human that was born. But today, just as we should all days, we celebrate the God-man who came. The one who came to die for us and to be resurrected. The one who gives us life. In Hebrews chapter 1, the writer of Hebrews, the pastor if you want to call him, he has already told us how God has spoken. Listen in verse 1, how he describes it. He says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. 
So remember, as we talked about last week, the pastor writing in Hebrews, he says that God had already spoken in the past, in the days of old. Particularly, he had spoken through the prophets. He had given the prophetic voice of the Messiah. He had told us that God was working. And the writer of Hebrews says that now God has done something more. He contrasts. He says, you had the days then, now you have our days, these last days. You had the prophets then, but now you have the voice of the Son. I want to reiterate. The voice of the Son, the representation of the Son is certainly always better even than the prophets themselves. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is trying to remind us. Is that when the Son spoke, when He broke upon the scene, when He brought to us the message of God, that it was much better than any message that we had ever heard. He says, now he has spoken through the Son. And then look at how the Son is described. Whom he is appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. You see, the writer of Hebrews said God spoke. He spoke through the Son. And that revelation was better. The Son was God's word to us. And he continues to communicate with us today. Thanks be to God that we can talk to him and he can talk to us. But the reason that he is so much better is not just because of the message that he spoke. The reason that he is so much better is because he is the God-man that came for us. Notice what it says about this son. He says the son is the heir of all things. He has been appointed the heir of all things. Now, what is an heir? An heir is one that is going to inherit the property. The one who is an heir is going to receive inheritance. So I was out and about the other day, and I noticed a bumper sticker. The bumper sticker said, we are out spending our kids' inheritance. I thought to myself, that's pretty good. I'm going to buy me one of those things. I tell my kids every time we go on a trip or so, I said, Remember, my goal in life is not to leave you money, but it is to leave you memories. The one who is an heir is one who is going to inherit. The one who is going to take charge of all of the possessions. The son has been appointed the heir of all things. Psalm chapter 2, a messianic psalm. Actually quoted in verse 5 by the writer of Hebrews. In Psalm 2 verse 8, it says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations of your inheritance, for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. That is that God speaks to the Son, and he said, You ask of me, and I'll give you the nations. I'll give you the possessions of the earth. I'll give you everything. Here the writer is building upon Psalm 2 and says to us, That God has appointed him heir of all things. He is appointed heir, as we'll see in a moment, because he is the creator of all things. But also because he is the redeemer of all things. You see, Jesus Christ came and lived obediently, died on the cross, was resurrected. And because not only of his position as creator, but his work as the redeemer... He had been set aside that all things would be possessed by him. Everything. Think of this. The baby in the manger possessed all things. He was the heir of all things. Even when he was lying in that manger, it was as good as done. The possession of all things. Some years ago, my parents decided that they would go ahead and they would divide out all of the property and all of the things that they had. 
It's kind of been a tradition through the years that when my mom's family got to a certain age, they would begin to go ahead and parcel things out. Even now, I know exactly my inheritance. I know, for example, that based upon the documents I have at home, I'll receive their house when something happens to them. I'll remind my dad oftentimes, that's my house now. <laughs> when he complains about the mowing, I remind him I can get somebody else to live there if I want to, to, to mow and all. And he gets back to mowing like he should, you know. It's already mine. In a sense, I possess it already. They're living there, and that's good, but it's already mine. Jesus, when he was there in the manger, everything was already his. Think of this. We celebrate the birth. We think about that baby in the manger, but that baby in the manger was not just some simple baby that had been born. This is one who is the heir of all things. He possessed everything. He possessed all of the earth itself. This week, as I was contemplating this passage and thinking about it in terms of Christmas, I thought to myself, when Jesus, when his parents walked up to that inn and there was no room in that inn, uh, they could have proclaimed, you know our child owns this place. Our child owns this inn because our child owns everything. What we celebrate today is the birth of of the one who is the heir of all things. It makes a difference, does it not, that he possesses everything? You see, Jesus possessed the inn in Bethlehem. Jesus possessed Bethlehem itself. Jesus possessed the nations. Jesus possessed the world. Jesus owns everything. Everything is owned by him. Even when he was there in the manger, there's a sense of where he still owned it all. We celebrate that. We also celebrate that because he came to this earth, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 17, we are joint heirs with him. Think of that. Jesus possesses everything. He owns it all. But through his life, death, and resurrection, through his bringing us into his family, we are joint heirs with him. We share in the inheritance of what God is going to do in the days to come. Because what we celebrate is, yes, his initial coming as a baby. But just as we know that he came once, we know that he will come again. And next time he will not be in a manger. But next time he will come in complete victory over every enemy. And that all things will be subjected to him. All things will be placed under his feet. And we ourselves will be able to reign with him. We celebrate today, and we realize the life change that he has brought. He is the heir of all things. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says as well. Through whom also he made the worlds. The Son is the creator of all things. He's the heir. He is the creator. Here it says that he made or created the worlds. That's what some of your translations say. Perhaps some of your translations will say something more like that he has created the ages. The original language here is that he has created the ages themselves. That is that this God, this Christ, this Jesus was the one who created time and space. Now this is where... My mind is really blown. Now, I know that some of you are probably thinking some negative things about your pastor because you think he's from Mississippi and it doesn't take a lot to blow his mind. And in many ways, you would be correct. I have a very simple mind. But this is incredible. 
This is incredible. Is that the baby that was there in that manger was the one who had created all things. And see, this is the message of Scripture. John chapter 1, for example, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And listen to this. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. That Jesus, the baby in the manger, was the one who created all things. The writer of Colossians, Paul himself, puts it this way. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. All things created by Jesus. He is the creator God. Later on in Hebrews chapter 11, he will say, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Jesus was the creator. The Son created all things that we know. So that means that Jesus' beginning did not happen in Bethlehem. I say this is going to blow my mind. It may blow some of your mind. Look, some of you from Bogalusa, that's worse than Mississippi. (laughs) So I know some of you are just totally. Jesus' beginning did not occur in Bethlehem. We celebrate his birth. We celebrate his coming to earth, but understand Jesus existed before Bethlehem. Jesus existed before the incarnation. Some of you say, well, yes, because we all did. We were all spirits, and then we, no, we did not. Some of y'all getting too much theology from It's a Wonderful Life. I told my kids yesterday, we watched it, I said, wonderful movie, terrible theology. You didn't exist beforehand. It was at the moment of conception that your life came to be. But Jesus, Jesus, his life, his existence predated Mary, predated the Holy Spirit's conception, predated the birth in Bethlehem. You see, Jesus is eternal. He always has been, and he always will be. He is from eternity past to eternity forward. Again, some of you who are math teachers here, that little sign that you use that you talk about infinity I've always had a little bit of trouble trying to put that in my mind is that there is something that is infinite. What I want you to know today that Jesus is eternal and he is infinite. He is from infinity past to infinity forward. There is no end with him. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. That little baby that was born in Bethlehem. The eternal God. The creator. (laughs) When I read those infancy narratives, we call them. When I read the Christmas story, I'm reminded that every individual, every place, everything that is involved was created by Jesus. Augustus Caesar, the supreme, magnificent, exalted ruler of of Rome, created by Jesus. Herod, the one that they would call the great, the one who could construct cities, 
and buildings, the one who could bring some type of stability, the one who was certainly evil, that Herod had life because of the baby Jesus. Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph had been created by Jesus. You say, but Jesus is the son. Yes, I understand. But this is where it just again amazes all of us, or it should, that he was the one who created Joseph and Mary. And not just Joseph and Mary, but he had created all of their family. Go back and trace the lineage. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their existence was because of Jesus. Go look at King David and King Solomon. Their existence was because of Jesus. What the writer of Hebrews says is that this is the one who has created all things. He possesses all things because he is the heir. But he is the one that was active in the creation of all things. Those angels that announced his birth... They sang glory to God. Those angels had been created by Jesus. There in the night as they would sing, the moon, the stars created by Jesus. Everything had been created by Jesus. And here he was in the manger. The Son is the creator of all things. The Son is the revelation of all things. Verse 3, it says, Who being the who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The brightness of his glory. Some translations may say the radiance of his glory. It means to shine out. It means to emit light. It means that there is some type, there is some type of display. Jesus is the display. He is the light of God's glory. He is revealed. Obviously, we've already talked about how he is the word revealing God to us. But he is the radiance of the glory. Old Testament. There are moments where you're just reading through and it talks about how God's glory comes down. Remember at the dedication of the tabernacle. The glory of God descended. Remember when the temple was dedicated by Solomon, it says that the glory of God came down and it filled the temple. And it said the priest could not even go in. There are moments where you see the Shekinah glory there in the Old Testament. I mean, everybody knew like that's God's presence. Everybody knew that God had shown up. My friends... When Jesus came to this this earth, when he came to walk among us, he demonstrated and displayed God's glory. Listen to the way John would frame it again. In John chapter 1 verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw the glory of God through Jesus. Because Jesus emits the glory. Well, you may not be able to see the sun today. When I was making my way over here, I tried to look for it and there were a few clouds around it. Sounds like the rest of the day may be a little bit rainy and a little bit dreary. But what I want you to note the next time you see that sun, and of course, when you see it, you have to be careful about looking at it in a straight manner, right? You have to be careful about looking at it directly because there is the sense of light and even could be danger of looking at it in an unprotected way. Jesus shines brighter than that sun. Jesus in his glory. He is the radiant brightness of the Father. And it says that he is the express image of his person. The express image of his person. 
Now, this language was used by those who would take maybe a stamp and they would make an imprint with that stamp. And when it was removed, you could see that it would be the exact image. Perhaps it would also speak about a coin, that a coin that would bear the exact image of an individual. Sometimes we'll take a picture, right? We'll take one together. And when you got six in the family, it's kind of hard, everybody looking the same way and smiling, even when they're growing up. I know some of you, when they're children especially, but even when they're growing up, like everybody's looking the same way and everybody's, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, we'll be like, hey, this is the picture we're going to use for Christmas cards. And everybody's like, no, not that one. That's the one I look, no. No, well, this, no, you only picked the one you look back. No. I'm sorry, it's a picture. It's a representation. There are times when I take a picture, I'm like, don't use that one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I tell Andy, I'm like, now when we do online pictures or so, I said, kind of get me from up here, please. And The exact image. The language, the Greek word is character. The character. You can hear it in the English, right? It's more than just a reflection. Jesus was more than just a representation. Jesus was the exact substance. He was the exact, he was the exact image of God Himself. Why? Because He was God. Colossians, again, said to us in chapter 1, in verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is God. When you hear the word firstborn, that means that He has primacy over everything. He was the creator of God, and He is divine. What do we celebrate at Christmas? God becoming man. We say Emmanuel, God with us. We call this the incarnation, that God comes in flesh because he was God. There are so many people that try to deny the deity of Jesus. There have always been people that have tried to deny the deity of Jesus. There are those that think, well, it says that he's the firstborn. That means he was the first created being. That was denounced many hundreds of years ago by the church as heresy. It is being carried on by some people, even those who call themselves Jehovah Witnesses and all of those. Let me tell you, Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. And it only works this way for us for salvation because God had to become man to do what we could not do for ourselves so that through him, you and I could have salvation. So listen to what he says. He is the exact image that he is God. Philippians chapter 2, he says, who being in the very form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. There were a lot of myths about how God would come down. Go back and study the Greek and the Roman myths. You'd see where they would talk about God's coming down and becoming flesh and going about their business. And my friends, there is no story like the story that we have of Jesus coming to take on flesh, God Himself, who came to live and to die for us. There is no other story that can bring salvation. So Jesus the Son is the heir of all things, the creator of all things, the revelation of all things, in particular, God himself. And the Son is the sustainer of all things. It says, upholding all things by the word of his power. Upholding. It was a word that would use to talk about how the boat would continue on as the ship was powered and the sail was powered by the wind. 
it would continue on. It would move forward. It would be sustained. Jesus is the one that holds everything together. The one that sustains all of this world. Now, I know you think sometimes it's totally out of control, and sometimes I think it is too, but I promise you nothing is out of control for Jesus Christ. He is upholding it by his own word. Again, back to Colossians. It says, and he, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things hold together. The word from Hebrews, upholding, is present tense, which means he goes on holding it together. Every single moment, every single day. He never takes off. He holds it together. All things consist through him. You and I can have absolute peace. You and I can have absolute peace confidence that things will hold together. Why? Because of Jesus. He knows what's going on in our lives and he holds it together. How does he do it? By his powerful word. Creation was accomplished by the word. The sustaining work of God is continued through his word. His powerful word. You see, the sun is God's glory. The sun is the heir of all things and the creator of all things, the revelation of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. The one that was in that manger. You see, I think it's great to come and to celebrate the birth. I think it is appropriate. But I think we must be careful that we don't become so enamored with just the baby that we forget that that baby was God in flesh. I hope that we don't get so caught up on all of the romanticized Christmas stories that we forget that that child is the one who created us. That that child was the one who holds us together each and every day. That that child, the expressed image of God, God himself, and the heir of all things, that that child has made all the difference in the world. I pray that this Christmas we would know that that child Jesus is God's glory. And as the angels, as they shouted forth, glory to God in the highest, so would we shout forth in praise, glory to God in the highest. Because our God has provided for us salvation and blessing. This Christmas, may we see him as he truly is. And may we worship him as the one who is above and better than everything else. Because yes, friends, as this passage says, Jesus is better. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for this day. Thank you for these moments. And God, right now, we pray that if there is one here that does not know your son, that they would accept the gift of salvation this Christmas. Father, for those of us here that can get caught up in all of the commercialization of Christmas, those of us who can get caught up in just uh, the fanciful ideas of just this baby. Father, today, would you remind us 
that this baby, while flesh, while human, that this baby was certainly God, your son, the heir of all things, the creator of all things, the revelation of all things, the sustainer of all things. And may we come and we, may we bow at the manger scene. We, may we bow before the cross. May we bow before the empty tomb, knowing that he is so much more than we. God, speak to us. Save that which is lost. Help those of us who need to be renewed and refreshed this Christmas season. Help us to know you and be revived through your spirit. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?